opportunity for you. So Shabaka's about to join us. Shabaka Hutchins is about to join us. Uh, oh, there Hi, he is. Hi. Hello. How you doing? How are you? Yeah, I'm good, man. Yeah, I just had a little technological um, meltdown. What happened? Um, there's some kind of Bluetooth issue. It's not boring. Oh, you know? uh, okay. Yeah. But yeah. Cool. Good I to see you. I was hoping man. that. Um, I was hoping that that we'd be able to sort of play together. But I tried a thing yesterday with Kush where we tried to see if there was any latency. Yeah. And um, we tried to sort of clapping in time, and he was a whole beat out. Well, yeah, maybe that's not going to work. So it wasn't going to work. <laughs> no. Unless we just do something where, like, you play something and then I play something almost, like, in response to it. Yeah, could do a bit of yeah. that. Also, yeah. like, I'm in a house as opposed to a studio, so it's, like, the volumes I can play at aren't, aren't great, yeah. So, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, yeah, you can try oh. just some different stuff. Yeah, how are you? Yeah, I'm good, man. Just, like, settling into this um, isolation life. Yeah. Because I'm kind of enjoying I think all musicians maybe have this, like inclination towards this type of lifestyle anyway yes, at some absolutely. part of the career of sitting yeah. in a room basically by yourself and just doing yeah. lots of practice or yeah. listening to music for hours and ends or just w working on something that takes a long time yeah exactly so yeah i mean for it, in some ways i'm finding it you know apart from obviously everything that's going on around the reason why we can can be here well yeah i'm finding it kind of refreshing being able to actually do loads of practice like almost like i'm in back in college yeah i know yeah. what you mean I know what you mean. It's it's nice. It's, it, it is. It does. It does. When your diary is just empty like that, and you just kind of just think, I could just kind of do a, plan a whole week of of practicing. Yeah. It's like I haven't done that for a long time. Yeah, and it's just knowing that you can actually do it because it's not that like you're going to be going anywhere. You're not going to have yeah. a phone call to like you know. Yeah, go exactly. To, to see someone in you know, um, I'm finding it good also in terms of like checking out like whole discographies. Right. Like, if I want to say, like, go, oh, you know what, tonight I'm going to sit down and listen to, like, loads of Evan Parker. Yeah. Like, being able to just, like, do, like, a whole artist, like, you know, a loads of, like, Hank Mobley or some, you know. Yeah. Just really getting deep into it. Yeah. I find that's a, yeah, something that I didn't realise that you do sometimes when you're running around doing loads of things. But that continuity yeah. in, like, yeah. what you're listening for, you know. Yeah, especially, I guess, if you listen to it chronologically as well, so you can hear how he's changed, how the artist's yeah, changed exactly. over time. Yeah, yeah, and this probably are you in London then? Yeah. Um, is this the longest time that you've been in in one place for quite a while? Um, you've been moving around a lot, haven't you? Over the last basically, few years. yeah. I think like all in one in one big chunk without going absolutely anywhere. Because sometimes I'll have like three periods, and then yeah. I'll just have like an odd gig here or there. Yeah. Um, but I think yeah, this is definitely one of the longest, and it will be the longest period that I've had just you know in one location for a while. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and um, need... hmm? have, have you had to cancel? Have you had to cancel loads of work? Oh yeah, everything's up. You know, well, basically yeah. my my year started um, as a hectic year in that I've had hectic years yeah. for the last two years. We're just doing like loads of gigs, and it was going to be that from like March, and basically everything's out. Yeah, you know, so yeah, there is no work. Um, and I guess you know, for me, it's the only way you can look at that is at it is in a positive way because otherwise it's. <laughs> Well, you know, yeah, there's like, no option. There's no alternative, there's, is there? Yeah, exactly. Um, so hopefully, you know, gigs will be rescheduled, you know, from yeah. like beginning of the autumn, but we just don't really know, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I know. We've, we've just, yeah, because we because you've just brought your album out as well, haven't you? With, yeah. With the ancestors. I mean, which presumably you're meant to be on tour now, are you? Or? Yeah, the tour is going to start, like, I think, like, the 23rd or 24th. Of April? Um, uh, yeah, like, four weeks in the US with, like, Coachella right. at the end with Comet. Um, and now it's all out. <laughs> oh, gutted. Yeah. That would have been awesome. Yeah, but you know. Yeah, we had, um, we had quite a long tour planned as well, because our album just came out. We had a, we had a tour starting about the 23rd of April, UK. Yeah, yeah. And that all got cancelled. But we've managed to reschedule the dates now, so um, we're doing them in uh, October, end of September okay. into October now. So we've just about quickly scrambled and managed to get something together for then. Hopefully we'll be able to do it then, you know. Yeah. Um, it's a bit of a shot in the dark because I guess it's just a kind of guesstimate as to how long we're going to be out of action for. Um, mm. But yeah, I mean, people, I, I did hear someone saying six months, but because what's happening in China is that they've all, they've all kind of said, right, we've got no more cases. They've all come out and then they have started getting it again and had to go back into lockdown. Yeah. This is the thing. I mean, it's not the most, you know, like, I guess 
trustworthy place to get information out of. <laughs> no, you know what I mean? well, there you go. So it's like, I guess, who knows? You know, like, if there's ever going to be a time when government sanctioned propaganda is going to be coming out, you know, is mm -hmm. it going to be now? So yeah. I don't trust anything, basically. Yeah. As Just in terms of, like, numbers, you know, this right. is, if, if you're dealing with a, a regime that's known for not necessarily giving accurate depictions of what it's doing at any given moment in time yeah 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 if they say the situation totally fine we're going back to to you know to business you know i'm, yeah. I'm going to view that with the same skepticism that i might have viewed something you know like three months ago yeah right exactly yeah but you know that doesn't really help us that much in terms of when we're going to start working again yeah right i mean are you are you you said you're practicing a lot you're going to do some you're going to start writing as well or you're just going to play for yeah yeah um i've got a couple of classical things to write for um All right. in All terms right. of like the end of the at the end of the year something for like london sinfonietta um, right, okay. just to kind of keep yeah it'll keep things bubbling but yeah i don't know it's like it's a weird thing that i was practicing up until like basically the start of the whole like outbreak i was practicing for the copeland the clarinet concerto All right. because i was going to do in the barbican in may as a part of that this thing that i'm putting on right okay. um and I was basically practicing really hard, like booking rehearsal studios, like really going in. And then yeah. all of a sudden, it just like, you know, there's one day and it just like all evaporated. Yeah. And that it's not going to happen. Yeah. You know? So then it's that weird thing where you've been practicing really hard for a specific event, like every single day, like really focusing on your technique and yeah. going down a certain way of mentally, you know, for the instrument. And then yeah. one day, it's just not there anymore. So then it like spun me for about a week of really? like, what do I practice? Yeah. You know, but now you still I still have the like, appetite to keep practicing. Like it's like still in a practice, but you haven't necessarily got the objective. Yeah, I mean that's this is always the struggle, basically, like finding the objective of practice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's yeah, I think it's slowly coming. I'm supposed to be doing a, a session, a, another live session that's to come out. I think for Boiler Room, but I'm not sure when it's going to come out, but probably in the next right. week. So I've been trying to practice some stuff for that, uh, which has been really good in terms of focus. What are you doing that at home? Yeah. All oh, right. Um, okay. And basically, the way that I always practice at home is just really quiet, and that's yeah. been my whole thing. Is like trying to get my like quiet dynamic. Yeah, so, yeah, like, yeah. Even if I play like the sax, up right here, it's like literally how quiet I can make it. Yeah. Um, with a good technique. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, <laughs> To get some oil because you can oh, always create the clicks. <laughs> oh man, there's so many clicks, and I've just kind of <laughs> learned to live with it. Yeah. That's the thing about playing quietly, doesn't it? The horn has to be 100, percent or you're just. It's got to be 100, percent but obviously you, you can't really go and see a repair guy. <laughs> well, no, not exactly not. Yeah. Mind you, um, mind you, um, Dave, I should explain for the listeners at home that Dave Walker um, designs and play uh, designs all the saxophones that we both play. I think pretty much. You play yeah. Only Dave's songs now, do you? Yeah. Even though you might. I've noticed I'm not playing Dave Holmes right there. I'm playing my content M. Um, just because I'm home quieter. so much. It is a bit quieter. Just like Dave Holmes are so resonant. That's one of the yeah. kind of good qualities of them. Yeah, in yeah, some yeah. ways, it's just too resonant for my little, for the little room I'm playing in. Yeah, right. Um, so you've got one, one note that kind of explodes your head. <laughs> yeah. And I'm kind of, because I'm playing in this little room, it's like I'm getting like slight cabin fever. So it might be that outside yeah. of the room, it sounds like no one can literally hear anything. Yeah, right. But in my head, I'm playing the saxophone, and it sounds like the loudest thing ever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I find with the Con 10M, it's, it's almost like more resonant in a different way, so you can play ultimately quieter. So, you know, if I'm playing, I might go like... Yeah. Keep it like really really you know like that kind of level you need a good um, read for that as well though yeah i mean <laughs> i've kind of gone down some re strength just to yeah. kind of deal with just this whole thing yeah. Yeah. yeah i mean don't get me wrong this sax is i got basically brought out all my class this is dave sax did you get them all out what's that did you get them all out for this uh well i got out both thing. of them because i didn't like i thought if i'm gonna play something i'm not so like 
you know, I don't want to just have my corner and not represent, you know, Dave Sachs. Well, yeah. Dave like, Sachs. you got a soprano as well, haven't you? Yeah. Oh. Actually, yeah, Dave Sachs is better. You can go, <laughs> but, uh, yeah. You it might be the novelty of the 10M, actually, just because I've not played it for ages and I just took it out. Yeah, but has the 10M got lacquer on it? Yeah, it does have lacquer. Does it? Is it as yeah. shiny as the Dave one? Um, not as shiny because obviously it's like from 1936. Because that's what I mean about the resonance when you're playing that quietly. It might be yeah. to do with that as well. I find Probably, that sometimes yeah. if it hasn't got any lacquer, when you play really quietly, it helps it sort of stay focused even when it's really quiet. Mm. But then, yeah, I've got a. I've got. A, have you seen my baritone? No. Have I shown you the baritone? No. I've got a baritone that he made as well. <sighs> this guy. Hold on. I have to hold the phone. Up. Put the phone away over here, so you can see because it's so big. It's a stab oh, yeah. right back. <laughs> nice. It's great though. It's great. I haven't got a read on it at the moment. I'll get a read. It. But um, it's the same as the tenor that I've got. Exactly the same. Mm. But um, it was so cool because he was he was sending me the when he was making it. He was sending me the sheet. He, he showed me a picture of the sheet of metal that it was going to be made from. Oh, yeah. And then he just oh. sort of showed me each stage. Oh, yeah. yeah. I've amazing. seen the picture of that, so yeah. Yeah, amazing. Incredible just to, to think how, how this, well, obviously, I mean, it's obvious that at one point it was a piece of metal, but just the fact that he makes them, they sound so old, they feel so old. The fact that it was only, didn't exist about four years ago. It's, yeah. It's completely bonkers. I mean, I'm interested in seeing how the saxes sound like in when actual time has gone by, for like in 10, 15 mm. years, yeah, when the lacquer like, is actually like, you know, broken down. Well, my um, tenor is, um, my tenor's really looking tired now. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's really green and, 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 um, and all that. But it's, but it's, um, it's just getting better. It's, yeah. not, it's, not, um, it's, it's not deteriorating in, in the slightest, actually. I feel I can get this quiet. <laughs> yeah, my read's not great, but when you get a quiet note on this thing, it can be really, really satisfying. Yeah. Bow turns are really good fun for faulty bonnets. What's the soprano like then? The soprano is great, actually. It's, um, I think I've, I've never actually like appreciated how drawn I am to the soprano until I got one. Have you and played I, one before? Yeah, like basically when I started the saxophone, the soprano was the first horn that I like played, like at the very beginning in that, like someone let me in Barbados a soprano sax just to play around with. Um, it must be sort of, must be nice being as that you're, you know, a clarinetist as well. Yeah, like it's that great. Kind of, to have that kind of um it's the kind connection. of yeah it's that like kind of same register but just with more power and i think yeah. if you're used to the clarinet in terms of like keeping your embouchure really tight you've yeah. got those muscles anyway yeah. so in some ways the soprano is just a lot easier to play yeah yeah yeah, yeah. You know, it's like and it just feels really like you just got like the actual system of it in terms of like, yeah, yeah, yeah. System. it's just really it's like straight yeah there's a straight in it um yeah um what else about soprano you know i've had these kind of like fantasies of going away and carrying instruments which i normally do um in terms of like little flutes but i like I've that i've seen I, you playing over those little flutes yeah i like the idea of like carrying a saxophone but not mm. having a massive tenor on me yeah you know? so the soprano is one of those things where i could be like going away somewhere and just have like a little soprano case on my back a little thing well yeah 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 i do that with the flute sometimes it's a flute's nice for that as well so, yeah it is you know Dave, Dave got, showed me this amazing, he sent me this amazing flute, which is something which I can't play. I'm absolutely rubbish at the flute. But, um, sorry, I keep going out of shot because I've got to get out of the drawer. But, um, I don't know where it's gone. Here it is. Someone just asks, how do you find transitioning to different instruments in the early days? Um, it's, it's, it's really tough. <laughs> depends depends what, you're, what you're playing, though, I think. Because from tenor to baritone is okay, but from tenor to flute, is impossible because the tenor just turns your mouth to a rubber yeah. and then you've got your your mouth has to be like 
incredibly precise to play the flute. So that's a real nightmare. But clarinet to tenor must be a big jump as well, right? Yeah, I mean, I just think it, um, like recently I've been finding it okay. And I've been yeah. doing a lot of stuff with that um, silencer, you know, the... Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. That thing. And, you know, if you do them both with the tenor and the clarinet, it really focuses what you're doing with the tenor right to the front muscles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I'm finding it that, yeah, like before I was maybe putting a bit more tenor in my mouth. Mm -hmm. um, whereas now I feel like my tenor embouchure is getting close to my clarinet embouchure. Right, okay. Um, yeah, in that it's slightly less in the mouth. Um, everything is quite relaxed, but mm. it's like tighter at the front, basically, and then very open from the short down. Yeah. Yeah, that's the only way I can just kind of describe it. Whereas you before, just... I think I used to just stuff a bit more in my mouth and blow really hard. But are you, are you using softer reeds then as well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. basically. So, so like, big, big mouthpiece though, right? Yeah, for my for the regular like gigs, like outside when I'm not playing in the in the, in the kind of bedroom. Yeah. Um, I'm like a ten star, and yeah. then kind of too soft. Yeah. Because that's select. So it's just like you know, it's pretty yeah. easy to play. You know. Yeah, 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 yeah. And you can like blow a lot of air through it, but because the mouthpiece is so open, it mm. just kind of takes it. You know, it doesn't like the the, the reed doesn't kind of like lose lose power. When yeah, you yeah, yeah. Blow a lot of air through it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. There's someone here saying they're struggling with my sound at the moment. It's pretty breathy. How would you combat and work on that? It sounds like too, your reed's too hard. How hard is yeah. your reed, Brad? Bradley? Or well, the mouthpiece is too open, maybe. Bradley Gore. Yeah. I mean, it's one of those things, isn't it? And I know that you spent a long time going through. Millions of mouthpieces. I kind oh, of had to. I kind of <laughs> had to stop myself for a while, um, and then just focus on the one that I had. But um, sometimes it can be that, can't it? it? Can be equipment, and then sometimes it can just be needing to just kind of practice a bit more. Yeah. Really. It's yeah. I mean, with a lot of things, it's like with music. It's literally like the more you practice, the more you, uh, <laughs> you know, you get better at something. As in, like if yeah. you spend loads, like in. in inexplicable amount of time practicing your long notes yeah you know, exactly by the end of it you will be you know you'll be you'll be better at it i found this i had this amazing book um it's a trevor y um flute book he wrote loads of amazing flute books and there's uh one i can't remember which exact one it is but he has like an overtone exercise in the flute book where you do bugle calls where you where you get the low note and you split it into its octave and all that where you kind of go Oh, this, I might not be able to do this now because it's all. Awesome. All from the low B flat. And oh, then okay. you. So then you do all these. Um, you can do bugle calls. And then you do from B and from C and C sharp, and you do that every day for a while, and it really sorts you out, you know. Yeah. Because then, then you can do all of them at the same time. Yeah. Or... Like that. Yeah. And then that, that really helps helps focus and everything. He says it's a three point five Rico Royal, but what mouthpiece is it? We should do like but, a clinic. <laughs> <laughs> like but basically, it's probably just too hard anyway. Because, you well, know, like, yeah. even if he's on like a size six reed, like opening mouthpiece, you could even be get a, like a, you know, a three and it would be enough. Yeah. You know, it's, I mean, the other thing as well is that I don't know what you what you do with reeds. Do you ever use one of these? Hold on. Sorry, I keep going out of shot. I've got to grab things from around the studio. Do you ever use one of these? These um, glass pencils yeah i've got an equivalent of that yeah because that's equivalent. maybe something for bradley to, to 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 look at it's one of these it's a van doren glass pencil where you can shave your reed and you can make it you can make any reed work so it might not be that your a three and a half is too hard for you but it might just be that one that you're trying to get someone on just needs a bit of sorting out with that mm. <laughs> what's a good idea sometimes as well obviously not in the time of being on lockdown but it's mm. to like when shops are back open to get like basically two of each size of reed, maybe like three sizes yeah. down. So yeah. that like if you're not entirely sure of your like setup, if it's too hard, you can spend a, a lot of time on just two, um, you know, on, on each size of reeds. 
because it yeah. might you know sometimes I'm like sounding pretty breathy in, in you know in terms of um, playing really quietly, um, and it just means you know I, I need to go down the reset. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and it's one of those things where you might not realize you need to go down. You might until just kind of start it. until you try it. You know, you might just be adjusting those. You know, yeah. Like, <laughs> Sounds nice that. What's that mouthpiece? This is a this is one of the an, another Morgan Fry. So that mouthpiece oh, okay. normally plays Morgan Fry anyway. Um, Dave one? This is a Dave one. They've basically got him to make him a mouthpiece that's like yeah. specifically designed for his saxes. Yeah. Uh, and it's really great. It's, it's great to play this kind of dynamic, you yeah. know. It's, um yeah, it's kind of really rich sound, but fine on the gigs. I just need to have metal, basically. I just need yeah. that, that resonance just to kind of cut. And that uh, neck, you've got one of those crooks, haven't you? That's a copper one, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah I've, got one, kind of... I've got one that isn't copper. Uh, sure mine's gone, yeah, I've got, is it that? Is it that? That's the one, isn't it? Yeah, that's the one. I was it's reading right? some stuff about copper. Have you read anything in terms of like no. antibacteria, antiviral properties? No. You know, oh, yes, I, Kush knows about that. Yeah, apparently they used to do a lot of lining of public um, spaces in terms of like what they would use bedposts for in hospitals, what they would put on like um, uh, like railings. They put a lot, use a lot of copper. Um, right, okay. And I just read something that because of the, I think the ionizing properties in copper, it does something to bacteria in terms of having it not stay on it and live as long as it would maybe, right. you know, like regular metal. Um, so I just like the idea of using a copper neck. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Does it sound good? Does it sound different though? Yeah, this I can't say exactly what it is in, in that the difference between it and the other mount, the other cook that I was using. Yeah, it's so like specific. It's something about the the kind of brightness, but the ease in which it like the kind of the sound pinks. That's the, the best I can put it. Do you, do you find that the octave, me octave key mechanism is a bit difficult to use, though, with this, that, that one? I find that mine, I find that that doesn't always work that well. Uh -huh. no, I, talked to about it. I think yours is probably a later version than this one. This is a project. Yeah, like basically just before the lockdown, like maybe a week before, I just had this idea to go to Dave and just like make that trip to Leeds and just kind of like have him check out Mike's horn, like make sure it's all working. Yeah. Um, and he gave me this crook, so this is like the, the most recent. You know, okay. Sort it out. It'd be interesting to know how it's different. Is that this thing here? Is it wobble, a bit wobbly? No, no. He sorted that all out. He sorted he it basically out. Basically, okay. got all this kind of like mechanism on the on here, basically. Um, yeah, on this part. That, yeah. That kind of stops the wobble. Okay. Let me work out. Okay. And has it got um? Has it got like a little metal slot inside on the on the cork? Um, no, he was telling me about that, but it doesn't have that. Can basically. you see that? Yeah. Can you see that? Cool. Yeah, yeah. You told me about this. It's it's a I, I, I don't know. I mean, this this it does sound great. This it is huge, but if you, I've cut my mouth a couple of times going before putting my mouthpiece on, and sort of caught my lip on this rusty metal <laughs> thing, which is a bit of a bit of a worry. Uh, someone's saying that if we play, it delays it. If we play in it, it delays it. Yeah. If you have any play in it, it delays it. If it delays what? Oh, hold on. There's a question before it, I think. How have you guys found translating the sound you want when you get into the studio? For example, Shabaka with the comet you use today. Ah. Is, well, that, is, that, is that related to that? If you have any play, it delays it. I'm not sure. No, no. I think you when we kind of play the saxophone, it maybe has a delay on it. If you've got any play in this, Adrian, perhaps you could explain. I think you've baffled us both there with that. Maybe. But, but um, in terms of translating the sound, um, I don't know. I, I use the kind of memory man, the same as I used when I was in Melody South Down. Yep. Um, recently, I've got an El Caspian um, kind of delay that I've been using, actually. Um, what, what delay? An El Caspian. Don't know that. Um, it's just another like kind of delay box, kind of small delay box. Um, that has a basic sound. I find the signal is a little cleaner than the memory man. Yeah. Uh, and in Comet, just because the, the kind of frequencies that the synth takes up are so overpowering when Dan really kind of starts putting up all the filters. 
it really yeah. benefits from having a little bit more clarity than the memory man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got a yeah. digital delay for that for that reason yeah. as well. I haven't really used it an awful lot, but it's quite nice. I've got a kind of a certain route through the pedals where it can be completely digital and really sort of sparkly oh. if I want. Or it can be really sort of murky and, and dark. But uh, it's got some questions here. I'm new to the saxophone. I was wondering what advice you'd give to people starting out. Um play lots of long notes and oh, yeah. and just enjoy it really. I mean it's about it's about getting it to sound to sort of sound good without hurting, I think, isn't it? <laughs> 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 you start. <laughs> I play French horn, which is really a jazz instrument, but play, absolutely love both of your music. How would you advise someone like me to get playing stuff similar to yours? Huh. What do you reckon? Um I think the main thing I guess if she's coming from like a classical background, it's just like the listening to music and playing along to it. Yeah. You know, so you can hear yourself inside the thing that you're trying to do. Um, yeah, like find, just finding a way into the music is the main thing. And it might be that, you know, your way in involves less, you know, more or less kind of specific technical stuff. It might yeah. be that your way in is jamming on one note or jamming on two notes. Yeah. Um, and the easiest note that you can and then that kind of the ease of you know what you find find is easy you might kind of develop over time yeah um and then it's, it's just a process of just like learning basically loads of stuff you know yeah. and then figuring out what you don't want to play finding your voice doesn't it as well because that's yeah. the thing about saxophone it's not like well it's like any instrument i suppose in a way that you it can be it, you can create an incredibly personal sound with it which and it's a very physical feeling of doing that as well it's, it's all about your mouth which is a very kind of I don't know it's, we do a lot of stuff with our mouths don't we so it's kind of like that kind of that kind of identity is easy to easy to really feel deeply when you're doing it with your mouth sometimes and why uh, oh there's lots of questions here oh, wow. I, to, I didn't want to skip too many of them I just wanted to clarify Adrian Cox who says that if, if there are any play on the mechanism on that crook it's just occasionally if there's any play on the mechanism, <laughs> it's just occasionally less responsive. Yeah, like the octave key is less responsive, and that can really mess you up because suddenly you're having to really, really blast just to go up, to go high, I find. But then you sounds like you don't get that. Yeah, this one is okay. I've got another one which is quite cool, which Dave, Dave has got me, which um, I haven't really tried yet, which is a, a, baritone, a silver baritone one that's got a pickup in it. Oh, yeah, I've got one of these. Have you tried it? I've not actually tried it yet, no. I've had it for no, a while. Um, I haven't tried it. He, well, he did give me another one, but the hole was in the wrong place. So oh, it's this one, but he's moved the hole now. So I haven't actually tried it. I mean, it's it's quite a nice idea. It's quite a baffling idea, isn't it? That, that you can get a really good sound from this part of the horn, even though the horn's huge. But yeah, I guess the same principle up. of the, the flute, where you'd mic yeah. like the top of the flute by your, by your mouth. Exactly, yeah. 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 Can you talk about some underrated, lesser known saxophone players that have been a big influence? Uh, um, George Adams. Oh, yeah. I love What's George Adams. Really? Yeah, I've not checked out a lot of George Adams, actually. He played no. with Mingus. Yeah. Yeah. George Adams, amazing. Um, um, I don't know if Archie Shepp isn't lesser known, is he? He's with... If you do. Um, <laughs> Warren um, Marsh has been an influence, I think, in a kind of weird way that you probably don't hear at all from me. In that I've I listened to that. a lot of Warren Marsh in my time. I can hear that. Yeah. Where you're being quite structural. Yeah, and, and I think there's a kind of there's a way that Warren Marsh basically like has his sound, which I really like, in terms of it being very uh, quite a dry, like. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That kind of yeah. Yeah. Quite um, earnest sounding. It's got it's almost kind of classical as well in that yeah. sort of way of being quite very precise. It's not an emotional thing, is it particularly? Yeah. I kind of like that. Uh, it's like not being emotional, like to yeah. the point when if you are emotional, it's because you, you're kind of overcome with being emotional. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, being it's quite, quite kind of down. like, yeah. And I actually remember you being like having a, not, not same, same approach, but remember sometimes I'd hear you playing like polar bear and occasionally yeah. increase, lady, increase at Laderland, where you're yeah. like standing there like completely motionless. Yeah. Like really not moving anything about your fingers and being really, really intense. Yeah. And then it's almost like the point where your body starts to move 
yeah. it's the point where you really can't take it anymore. Where you just yeah, kind of yeah. like self it and like you know take so and I really like that approach of like only making any excess movement. Yeah. When like you really can't bear it anymore, you just like burst into this, you know. Yeah, and sometimes it's like you're with, with, with the polar bear, for instance. It was like there's so much space with the solo that you were able to kind of. It's almost like you kind of you're going to lay out all your things. Okay, so I've got this chord. I've got all this space. So I could I can go here with it. I can go there with it. So there's a period of time where you're just kind of like getting opening the box and getting everything out of the box and looking at what you're going to do. You know, and sort of building up this landscape. And then once you're in the landscape, you can explore. But that kind of thing of playing without emotion was was even though I was doing it, it was often kind of Seb and Tom Herbert behind me, just just waiting, you know, it's just like, okay, we're here, come on, come on, he's going to do it now, he's going to go now, oh, he's not going yeah. yet, okay, come on, come on now, oh, no, he's not going yet, you know, so you've got these guys behind you kind of go, come on, come on, <laughs> <You know? laughs> and it's just building slower and slower, then eventually you go, and it's, okay, here we go, you know. Yeah, I found that was quite an emo, it's almost like quite an emotional band, you know, yeah. like when I did some set, you know, like kind of gigs with me and you, in terms of like, I remember there's this one tour that we did around Europe, and I've actually got the whole tour recorded. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, I recorded every single gig, and we did about like eight gigs in a row. Um, and I remember basically Seb was getting like a bit moody at the first part of the tour, you know, in, terms, in relation to the music. But then in the middle, we did a gig in, in Munich at Unterfahrt. And yeah. basically, before the gig, Seb sat down and he's like, I'm going to tell you, if you don't mind, what, what everyone should be doing. You know, and he yeah. basically went through the whole set with us, like what he thought it should actually be, as opposed to us just kind of interpreting it yeah. in a way that he wasn't that happy with. And then from that point, it's like the music just became a different emotional thing yeah, altogether. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like the whole, uh, you know, you know, landscape of the music has totally changed. So it's really interesting, you know. Yeah. And that like yeah, psychological, because yeah. it was like psychological things. It's like how you're like, how you're approaching the music, you know, how you're like, you know. The, att the attitude of going into it and like where you go to yeah yeah that was difficult music that 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 was the last album wasn't it that was that was something i found that quite hard to get and it's normally quite strange because for all the time of polar bear there's always kind of instant said would write something and i just get it just and it wasn't and it, it was an instant kind of interpretation that was always right and then with that one it took a long time a long yeah. time to, like six months or something a lot of playing it to get to the point where i felt like he was we were doing what he he kind of heard, you know. Yeah. It's one of those things. There's one okay. of these gigs. No, there's one of these gigs that I remember where we did. I think it was me and you did it, and it was in Into the Great Wide Open. So on oh, that yeah. like island off the coast yeah, of yeah, the yeah, yeah. Holland. Yeah. Yeah, you take like a kind of hour and a half long ferry to get to it. Yeah. Um, but we did this gig in the middle of the woods, like in yeah. a, literally in a clearing in the woods. Um, yeah. And we did it at like about five o'clock, so that it was like that point where we started and the sun was up and yeah. like in the midst of the gig it kind of became dusk and then like the sun completely kind of dropped and we yeah. never have done gigs in that time period they're always like really epic something yeah, like yeah, yeah. Make pretty mystical that goes down in that like dusk yeah time. and i remember like we just really got that music it was so like it was quite a, a powerful gig yeah i've got that recorded as well i think somewhere have you wow so, yeah I, I had a phase of basically recording all my gigs like yeah, loads of years of just recording everything, and I've just got them on a like uh, folder on my computer. Yeah, that must be quite a big folder. Yeah, just got loads, like loads of basically all the gigs up until the point of like maybe three years ago and two, three years ago, I started doing lots of gigs um, of the same music. Yeah, you know, I record them because like we basically almost like take that polar bear approach of like having a set and just playing that set every single day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, until you got an album, a new album, and then you kind of practice a new set for the new album. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so yeah, when it was a bit more like doing gigs that would be drastically different gig to gig, then I'd record them all. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's yeah. I remember we were record. I was recording a lot for ages and ages. I used to get to the. I used to whenever I recorded a gig, I used to hate my playing. I'd listen back to it and I just couldn't stand my playing. And it happened so often. At one point, I just got to the point where it's like, well. What if I just try and find out what it is that I hate about my playing, rather right. than, rather than just being self-conscious? Or maybe I'm just being vain and just oh, I hate the sound of my own voice. It's just that kind of thing. Or maybe there is actually something real here that I could fix. So I, I actually transcribed my solo, right. um, and managed to pinpoint what it was that I didn't like, and then removed it and stopped doing it, and then kept doing that for a while, 
and eventually I got to the point where I recorded a, a gig and listened back to it and actually liked what I did. So I managed to remove the things that I didn't like. And then that, from that point on, I actually started liking my playing, which was a huge, a huge, um, a huge moment for me because it meant I could stop overplaying then because mm. I wasn't sort of trying or I wasn't sort of, it, yeah, I wasn't trying anymore. I was just like, I, I sort of, I kind of found my voice by sort of like, uh, sort of digging for it like an archaeologist in a way, sort of just kind of just trying to find it and analyzing yeah. it and working it out, you know. Um, but then that became, and then that turned into writing, and then I was able to write with that voice, which yeah. then sort of kind of became much more holistic thing. But I have some questions here. Um, Kush asked a question, um, which is that: Is there any connection to your sort of music in terms of? The Comet is Coming, Sons of Kemet, and Chewbacca and the Ancestors, like a kind of narrative thread running through all the different albums, or are they different, very separate projects? Um, I guess, you know, there is a narrative thread in that. I think anything that you do artistically with integrity will have something that, like, directly connects to your life or, like, your beliefs on an intimate level. Yep. So, like, if you're a part of a band, you know, you what you're into as a person will have some influence on the yeah. kind of the total output of the band, even if it's like a third of that influence or a fifth yeah. of that influence. Um, yeah. So I think that literally I am the common thread and there's something of necessarily maybe like what, how I respond to other people's influences uh, and add to them or like certain things get emphasized that actually um, creates a thread without me having to think I'm going to like continue this thread by doing a specific yeah. thing. Yeah. yeah. So I think, yeah, the answer is yes. But um, And I could basically like kind of analyze myself and like figure that out. But it's not something that I kind of consciously go, I am mm. like, you know, getting a definite thread from like the ancestors to extend the chemistry. Yeah. You know, the comet. Um, there is a thread within them, within the project, isn't there? Yeah. The, the ancestors one is bound by lots of poetry. And there's, the, there's poetry, especially the latest album. Oh, yeah. I see there is there's poetry in all three of them, actually. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Since it came out with Joshua and actually and Comet with like Kate Tempest and yeah, uh, and Joshua course, as well. Yeah. Um, the other thing is in terms of like the live set, in in that we we play a, a complete set with no stops. Yeah. Um, with, with, with the ancestors or with all the bands? with all three of them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we're kind of into that thing with all three bands of having like a, a show. Yeah. Where you might have at one point you introduce the band or not, um, but yeah. other than that you just produce a show of music. Yeah. Uh, and I think actually it, that's one of the things that maybe distinguishes it, you know, in all our bands, but yourself down to the same thing, I guess. Um, where a lot of American bands, they, they interact with the audience. Yeah. And they kind of stop the music and they, they announce themselves. And it's almost like they break, the, the, the music becomes, has a theatrical aspect. Yeah. Because as soon as you actually engage with the audience outside of the, uh, outside of the actual ball. music, yeah, it becomes theatre. Yeah, you know, not in a in a derogatory way, but just in a in an actual, you know, you know, theatrics of it. Um, so when you kind of like have more music, you just eliminate that theater. The theater is all actually wrapped up within the persona with the horn in it, with the horn in your hand. Yeah, 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 sure. Unless you bring them in and make them part of the music. Yeah, which is another mm. part. Of That's another thing. Not quite there yet. <laughs> <laughs> and I have yeah. actually been thinking about that. Uh, yeah. The, how to be more theatrical in terms of like the the, the kind of pers persona you embody when you're not actually playing. Yeah. You know, so like, and it's something where I think when you come out of college and you're in that like very jazz mode, you're really not aware of the persona you embody. So it means that you can yeah. do a solo and then just like sulk in the back of the stage. Yeah, yeah. Just, um, just be really moody and kind of unresponsive. Um, and it's almost like the theatre is having the opposite of that where you keep some kind of like pers personality um, yeah. with, you know, of what you've been conjuring. Because I guess when you're playing, you're conjuring a kind of personality, a persona. Yeah. And it's about trying to keep that, that line going all the way through the set and never breaking out of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I know the vocalists have that. Have that. I remember Kush had that when we first joined Melt because he was used to always having a guitar. Mm. And then all of a sudden he didn't have his guitar anymore. And it's, what, what am I supposed to do during the when I'm not singing? You know, um, and he rectified that by jumping in the crowd and, uh, <laughs> and cuddling, cuddling people. Nice. <laughs> but, um, 
So there's loads of questions here. We could talk for hours. Um, yeah. Fan from Tun Tunisia, please release new stuff. Oh yeah. You've only just released some new stuff though. Wow. Yeah, but we actually we're mixing the new Santa Kemet album right now. So hopefully that's gonna be out in the end of the year, if not next year. Um, are you guys aware of Dan Speedy Wonderground and the use of sax in the post punk style bands, for example, Black Country, New Road and Black Midi with Caddy Akinibi? Yes, we are aware of Dan, know him pretty well, and recorded the track for him with Melt Yourself Down. Uh, and I am very aware of the use of sax in post punk style bands. So yes. Wherever yeah, Black Midi is amazing as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's all them at Six Music Festival. Um, they're great. Um, good morning, good morning. I love the opening saxophone part of the improv class. Oh, I know that another weapon was recorded with Speedy. How did you find the recording process? Um, you didn't actually do that one. I think that was that was just coming to the end of your time with Melch. Yeah. Um, that was fun. It was good. Uh, it Dan's quite quick in the studio which is good because we can be quite slow so it's good to be in a in a quick scenario like that um it was really good fun it was really nice to hear what he'd been doing because he saw us play at glastonbury in 2014 at the bird's nest which is this tiny venue up on the top of a massive hill um and he was uh, and he was he, he he really liked it and he said that i think we broke the pa that night and, um, he was sort of he loved the sound of the pa kind of distorted and breaking up the sound getting really messed up so he He'd been wanting to do something that had that similar sort of thing for a while, so it was nice to kind of get, you know, finally get get it going. You know. Uh, all right. Have you ever used Max MSP in your work? I've not, I never. I've never done that either. Well, we've obviously played with. We both played with Lee Cutter John a lot, who used Max MSP a lot in Polar Bear. But um, so I have. We've but we've both played and had our playing manipulated by someone using Max MSP. Um, which was always really good fun, but never actually tried to use it myself. I was scared, I'm scared of it. It just looks so complicated. Yeah, I'm pretty like relatively illiterate when it comes to like production software myself. Right. I am. Um, I think I, my I kind of have made a, a career of like partnering with people that do things. Yeah. That do aspects of music well, as opposed to learning them myself. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. I, I do what I do, and I try to do it well. But then it's like. I, I probably know as much logic as like an A, like a kind of like A-level student. Right, you know, okay. A bad student, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but I just kind of like know the right people that know how to use it and I just play the saxophone. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. But that's probably quite sensible, you know, because yeah. I've, had, I've had a go at doing all sorts of stuff and probably wasted a lot of time trying to sort of learn how to release records on my own label and learn how to produce and stuff like that. Actually, the, the production thing is now finally, after about 15 years, starting to come, come together. But... Um, uh, but yeah, the uh, the thing didn't really work. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean I'm like this. That's one of the things I'm actually spending time with in this you know isolation period, trying to actually learn logic and Ableton, you know, finally because I think you you know the, you do get a lot of benefits being able to produce your own, you know, music to a point, especially when you become busy that you can just give, you know, give a real good impression of what you want, you know, in terms yeah. of manipulating sound to someone who can then take it to the next level. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's nice to be able to uh, let a, to to have a control over the whole band or the whole sound spectrum. Um, so that becomes an extension of your playing in a way. So it's like you can control control the, the whole band as well as you can control the saxophone. Well, not necessarily the band, but the whole sound. That's yeah. something I'm I'm not I'm, I'm I'm nowhere near being able to do that as well as I can do it with the saxophone. But I'm starting to get into a flow with it, so I feel like I can create my own sound, which is nice. I mean, the last album we just did, I did a lot of the production where I'd, we'd, we'd, go and, we'd go and see the producer with the demo and, 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 and he would say, oh, go and do this, go and do that. And he was always right. <laughs> He's, uh, this guy called, called Youth, who's a legend and a genius. And it's fantastic because he'd sort of listen to the track and sort of say, oh, that chorus is too long. The intro needs to get rid of the intro and this is that. That's going nowhere. Do something with this. So I'd go home and I'd do all the editing and do all that production and re-record everything myself and then take it back to him and he'd hit, listen to it and go, yeah, that's better, blah, blah, blah. And then, you know, we had that process. Um, so it was, it was quite nice. It was like being given tasks. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I then had to go do it. And it took me ages. It took so long. You know, like, it's a bit like when you get, when you're trying to redecorate your room and it, and, and it would take, it would take you months just to sort of do something that would take a, a professional, like an afternoon, you know, it's the same thing with production. Yeah. 
Do yeah. I just go and do that? And it's just like, shit, that's going to take me a week. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, Marija, we've been recently in touch with Speedy and Pierre said that our new single reminded him of Melt Yourself Down, which absolutely burst away. Oh, that's nice. I'll have to check you guys out. What are the odds that Shabak and the ancestors make it to the US this year after the unfortunate cancellation of all this madness? What's that? What are the odds oh. that Shabak and the ancestors make it to the US after the unfortunate cancellation of all this madness? Um, I think the odds are pretty good. It just all like this is a, a common question for for like musicians whose tours are being yeah. cancelled. How it long? Just all, what's that? <laughs> how long are we going to wait? Yeah, that's the thing. I think we, it just depends how re the reality plays out. Like no one, like really nobody knows. Like it could, yeah. it, you know, there is a reality in which things just kind of like bubble up and then kind of get to some kind of level of normality within the next six months. Yeah. You know, that could happen. And then in that case, it could be that we're flying to the States the end of the year, uh, if not the end of, you know, beginning of next year. But who knows, you know? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. Who, like it might be that the, the, the industry is, is messed up for a whole year. Personally, I am preparing myself psychologically for the industry just music kind of not happening for a year yeah um and if if it gets back to some normality within a year i'm just seeing that as a kind of you know great kind of bonus in life yeah but i think that we're in a kind of like pretty like un unprecedented situation where we yes. can just have no live music in a in a whole year i know well we're all scrambling to try and find new ways to to kind of deal with the deal with the sort of the technology which is you know one of the reasons why we're doing this today but at yeah. the same time you know i'm finding that i'm spending more time connecting with people in isolation i mean for instance we've been talking about doing this for like five years or something and yeah <laughs> i never got around to it until until now you know so in a way i think it's connecting people in, in ways that maybe they wouldn't have connected before and so i mean we're all extremely creative and we're all extremely hungry to keep doing new things so we're gonna we're gonna find a way to make it happen I just think yeah. technology's got to catch up a bit because it's really hard. You can't have a jam yet. I'm yeah. sure it's around the corner, but it'd be so great if we could play and it'd be, a, it'd be you know, the, the Wi-Fi connection was and the technology was quick enough to actually be able to make it all work together. Well, this That'd is the so thing cool. with, like, five, obviously the whole, like, kind of issue of 5G. If, you know, I, yeah. I'm, I'm just about reading up on the kind of, not, the, the kind of harmful aspects of 5G. But in yeah, principle, really if it wasn't that harmful, it would be amazing because it would mean that we actually would be able to do exactly that. Is, it, is like, it really harmful? Um, basically, I, I'll say I don't know that A friend has just sent me a big folder of loads of stuff to look into about it. So oh, really? I, I've just been hearing from a lot of people that it is really harmful and I've just been seeing on the news here and there that there are protests about it um, on those levels, but I just don't know enough about it to be able to say, like give an opinion on it yet yeah 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 it's something i'm looking into but if if it were to just like happen and it was just a reality that we had to just evolve into then it, that that would be the the kind of solving of that problem in that the internet speed would really be so quick that we yeah. could play together and it wouldn't be a problem yeah right exactly yeah because if you count if i if we if i count you in and we'll try and clap on try and clap on one oh yeah because it feels like right now it feels like there's no latency between us yeah. whatsoever Right, so if if if, we, if I if I count you in, we're just going to clap on beat one and see if we're yeah. in the same place. One, two, three, four. Yeah, you're a whole beat behind. Really? Because yeah. to me, I heard you in time. Yeah. So you so might be on you, one. If, if you do it now. One, two, three, four. Oh yeah, yeah, you're a beat behind. <laughs> so, but you were completely. We were completely in time from my point of view. Yeah. So maybe that we are in time for the viewer. But we sound like we're apart. Well, maybe our viewers can tell us were we in time yeah. then, or were we out of time? Because if we're in time for the viewer, that could be a mind-bending exercise to try and play. Yeah, them. I did that <laughs> in the studio one time for this free jazz album nope. that never came out. <laughs> <laughs> nope. We, we got into like it was with Andrea Parkins, but I can't remember anyone. Oh, else. she's amazing. Yeah, but basically the guy had us so we couldn't hear any of ourselves in the headphones we could just hear the next person along in the chain. Right. And the next person couldn't hear themselves. They could just hear the next person. So everyone was playing a duet with someone else who couldn't hear them. <laughs> wow. 
Well, okay, I think it's confirmed. It's not. It's not, not in time. time. The thing. The thing is, though, when I when I counted you, you in, and hold on, how did, I counted you in, and we clapped, and I heard you as being out, but you heard us as being in. Yeah. So that means that the person who goes first is out. It, to the person who goes first, it's out, right? Yeah. Because then when we switched it round, it was the other, it was the opposite way round. Or it just might be that you hear yourself in time, but you don't hear the other person in time. I reckon we can still play, but just to make it not rhythmic. Yeah. You try it. That's right. Mm, what should I play? I don't know. Mm. Jingle bells. <laughs> I'm thinking instrument. Oh, double tenor. I'll tell you what you could do. I've got a weird, I've got a weird flutey thing. Oh, I can't find it now. I've got a weird wooden flute thing. The other thing as well, of course, is that I'm going through Bluetooth earphones as well. So there's another, that's another little latency. Oh yeah, that'll be, that'll be something. <laughs> Do you ever practice with your effects pedals? Um, no, not really. I, I'm really like I'm, um, lazy when it comes to effects pedals and I just mm. kind of get a sound and just like play with it. Yeah. I don't really experiment that much with the effects pedal. Yeah, it's yeah. quite a fun. Yeah, I should do. If I had a studio, the problem is I don't, it doesn't make sense to me having any type of studio when I'm not at home that much. Yeah. So I just kind of, when I'm practicing in the house, it'll just be really quiet. <laughs> you could probably put the, the, the pedals through a, like an amp and then put the amp through a pair of headphones. Yeah, I could do that too. And yeah. then you wouldn't hear the horn anymore, but you would hear the pedals. I'm just trying to see if I can put you on my Bluetooth speaker so I can hear you a bit better. Okay. Um, it's got like the moment I can't really hear you. Hear myself coming through your speaker. Really? Does it sound? I know it's a really weird delay with me sounding like really pixelated and. Saxophone, did you? <laughs> what is that? <laughs> <laughs> the hi hat. 
<laughs> so let's see if that sounded sounds okay. great with the delayed effect nice. so were you getting the delay or was I, I, I wasn't um, getting the delay I'm just kind of like I'm just getting the sound of my saxophone I'm going to see if I can put on my blue oh you can't hear me at all Oh, I thought that was someone in the room with you, but it's not. No, it's just my um device, basically. You've got like a little Japanese voice in your... He's connecting. Yeah. Okay. Wait a minute. So basically, I've got this little bow speaker. This is waterproof, yeah. and this is like what keeps me alive on tour. Yeah. Because it's tiny, and you can basically just like hear, you know, music aloud. It's yeah, like, it's know. literally like a tour in the center. So but you used to have a video play, didn't you? Didn't you used to have a B.O. play? Oh. Banging on yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I did have it, but um, it broke. Yeah, mine broke. Yeah. We've got two. Nicola bought me one, and, and she's got one of her own. They both broke. Yeah, this is it the must thing. be indestructible. This Buzz one is, is better in that it is actually yeah. indestructible. It's waterproof, for one. Right. Um, so you can just put it in the shower with you. Oh, really? Yeah, it's totally waterproof. Oh, that's cool. Um, and it just seems to be more durable. Like, I find if something isn't durable... The talk like being on the road lost, will just yeah. destroy it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. that B and O one was actually the sound was amazing. It? The sound's great, yeah. But something yeah. started happening with the bass. I found after so yeah, point. exactly the same here. The bass just goes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now. I'm glad it's, it's not just me. Even if you listen to jazz on it or something, it's just like the, just completely the double basses just completely destroy it. It's awful. No, yeah. So am I coming through your Bluetooth speaker now? No, I'm just kind of playing it normal, so it's fine. I can hear you though. I really want to get into listening to some more Messian actually. I had to do a thing recently for um, a magazine for uh, Quietus. I think it was oh, yeah. Quietus. About sort of, you know, 13 albums that have influenced me the most. And um, and, I, and I put the Messiana Tarang Tarangalila Symphony on there. Oh, nice. And um, Have you ever played um, any of the clarinet stuff on Quartet for the End of Time? Um... No, I've not. Actually, it's been on one of those things where I've never just been in an ensemble that was going to play. It. Oh, yeah, you know, yeah. I just I should have played it in college, but I just wasn't at the point which I was good enough to play. It, there wasn't any ensemble to play with. That clarinet part in that is like, incredible. That I think it's a solo clarinet piece, isn't it? Yeah. Where there's all those really long notes that just suddenly get really, really loud. It's yeah. amazing. Have you heard the Berio Sequenza? No, I haven't. Um, it's I've basically got a whole bunch of sequenzas. You want a sequenza for every instrument, basically. Oh, right, okay. um, but the clarinet one is epic. It's like it's something like twenty pages long. Well, I'm starting oh, really? to learn that. Yeah. Wow. You know what? We're gonna we're gonna cut off in one minute. So I reckon oh, yeah. I reckon what you'd need to do if you if you hang up and come back on, I reckon okay. with with, with reset. Okay, great. So if if everybody's if everybody's there, Shabaka's gonna go briefly and then come back and then we're gonna carry on. Hopefully, and if I go as well, we'll both come back. <laughs> so, man. Right. Okay, so Shab's, Shabak has gone. He's hopefully going to come back. So let me have a look. I'm going to press this button here. So I can do that to join. When he comes back. Um, so there he is. Add. Unable to join. He's unable to join. <laughs> ah! Right, okay. Hold on. How do I do this? Let's see. Try again. Anyone got any advice? Now's the time to give it to me. Um, George Crowley's there. We could say hello to George. <laughs> um, but Shibaka, I'm not, I'm not able to. Oh, just a minute. Where's he gone? Uh, this is fun. Uh, oh no, it's not letting me do it. Do you know what? I'm going to go, and then I'm going to come back on. So everybody stay there, and we'll be back in, a, in, in one minute. Just stay, so come back. We'll see you in a minute.
Waiting for shafts. Can you hear me, everyone? Is the sound working now? Can you hear that? Yeah, I can. I can hear it now, but a lot of people are saying no sound. Why is that? Can make, can they hear you? Um, I think everyone can hear everyone now. Okay, then sound back. There we go. Okay. So sound good for everybody. Brilliant. Now we've started this thing, which I haven't asked you about yet. Where yeah. um, someone in our team had this great idea, which was to get people to play the intro for our song every single day. Oh yeah. And just have a have lots of different saxophone players playing the intro. Um, uh, recording it and filming it and then uh, and sending it in and then we're going to make a huge montage of everybody playing it all together like as many saxophones as we possibly can. We're playing which intro? The intro to every single day which you probably don't know yet but I can send you a chart for it if you're up for it. Yeah, cool. Okay. Um, do you want to play play for a second and then I'll send you the chart? Yeah. Oh, we can do it separately. Maybe film it separately, film another time. I don't know. If we played it together now, it'd be, we'd both be a, a, a be out. Oh yeah, let's try baritone and bass clarinet. Good idea. Yeah. My reed's a bit scratchy. I can't play it very quietly. I have to play really quietly. <laughs> Is that it? <laughs> Is that it? Yeah. yeah, that's the end, eh? That's the end. That's all I can do. I just played everything I know on the baritone. <laughs> now I'm just going to try and get the mic, get the positioning a bit better so people can see a bit more than just my my mouth, my head kind of uh, doing weird things. <laughs> Oh no, I'm not doing every single day now. Oh, you're not? No. Oh no, I thought you. <laughs> oh right, do you want me to play every single day now? Okay, no, but I, don't, I need to send you the chart. No, I think we should do okay. that separately. <laughs> yeah, that's that's the intro to uh, one of our songs, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Until he comes back. Oh, it's gone, completely gone. Oh, right, okay. Let's um, try and get him back. Um, oh, he's come back now. Hold on then. Let's try this. Go live. Here we go. Waiting for him. Here he comes. He's connecting. There he is. He's back. Yeah, I'm back here. Yeah. No, no, I wasn't playing the intro to one of, <laughs> one of our songs. That would have been pretty weird. <laughs> pretty weird intro for a single, wouldn't it? <laughs> Getting that on the radio. <laughs> for me, you were just like, yeah, so I'm going to play this like intro every day. And you were like, mm. yeah. <laughs> yeah, that got you. Uh, no, no, I need to send you the chart, really. Um, but uh, yeah, no, I just thought we could do a bit of, yeah. The baritone and the bass clarinet might be fun. Have you got your Bluetooth speaker working now? Uh, no, it's not working. I think no, they might, it might just be something to do with the feed from Instagram not going into it. Really? Although if, if you're, if you're I'm using on, your Bluetooth. I'm using Bluetooth earphones, yeah. Hmm. I guess I could just use my headphones. Yeah. But then I won't be able to hear myself that much. Yeah, well. Let's see. Should be able to hear yourself. I can hear you. Can you hear me? Oh, I can hear you. Yeah. That's nice. Yeah, it's cool. I just had the weird sensation where I thought I can't really hear him very well. I'll, I'll get nearer to the phone. 
Oh yeah. Like the, like I'd be able to hear you better if I stood nearer. It's quite weird. Apparently, your brain doesn't know any difference between seeing the person on the screen and seeing them in the flesh. Really? Like yeah. Apparently, after your after this call, you're going to feel like we've like you we've literally just been hanging out. Apparently, your brain just doesn't know the difference. Yeah, I mean, I guess if you you know Makes see sense. reality is just something that's. <laughs> Our external reality is something that's very like separate, divided by something intrinsically from your internal reality. Then it doesn't yeah. actually matter if you're behind the screen or if you're, you yeah, know, next yeah. to me. Yeah. Other than vibe. <laughs> yeah, know? or um, one beat time lag. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Which is incredible how much that doesn't notice at all when we're talking, and yet it's completely impossible when you're like, yeah. in time. It's bizarre. I've got to sort this read out a bit. Well, you, 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 I think the plane thing isn't necessarily going to work. Because <laughs> you, you've got to play so quietly, haven't you? Yeah, I've got to play pretty quietly. Well, that's a nice looking uh, bass clarinet you've got there. This, yeah, so there's a story behind this bass clarinet, actually. Yeah. I did this advert for um, for Guinness that actually... Um, oh, I remember that, yeah. Remember that? Everyone was like applying to do this, doing versions to get this Guinness ad. So yeah. basically, yeah, there's a Guinness ad that came around um, and I was kind of put to do it for, through like I think like Brownswood or someone they yeah, yeah, like, yeah. if you could arrange the music for us we would do it on behalf of us so I basically got really far as in like got to the stage where I was like and I was on tour so I was basically in the tour bus arranging this music like transcribing like like kind of swing band parts and right and all this stuff and I got yeah. really far into it to the point where like we, we met with the ad guys they were like you're definitely going to use it um, oh right <laughs> yeah we kind of we, we got into the studio, we done take after take, band after band. It went on for like weeks and weeks. And we got the final take. We, we synced it up to the video. I've even got like a finished video. We got Leanne to even come down and just do like wow. a, like she did a voice on it. And we got the final thing. And then they like gamified the ad in <laughs> It oh. never came out. So I've got this video of the arrangement. And basically, they still gave me some money. Um, I think they had a kind of maybe a contingency fund or something uh, yeah. for all the work that I'd done for those couple of weeks in getting it. And basically, I took all that money and just bought this base planet. Right, okay. Yeah. And I mean, I was skint because I didn't have any money. But um, I basically, you know, years later, I've got this instrument that's completely implausible for someone to have. <laughs> <It's just> like, <laughs> right, okay. You, know, you just blew it all on that. I blew it all on the base planet, yeah. Right, okay. Is it a particularly top top quality one? Yeah, well, it's, I don't know it's an orchestra kind of one. So basically, you can get really good bass clarinets that only go down to bottom E flat. Right. Whereas orchestral ones are slightly longer. So this one is like it's really long. Right. Okay. Uh, it's the longest you can get, and this goes down to a low C. Right. Um, wow. Yeah, and you just don't really need that extra bit of instrument. Um, like all the jazz, like Eric Dolphy played the low E flat or a low D one. Yeah, um, and the the bigger instrument is basically just for for orchestra orchestral work. But so that goes it, lower than normal then. Yeah, but because it's a bigger instrument, it's just got a broader range of harmonics. So it's actually just a different instrument than the kind note. of. Give us a, so give the lowest note will be like. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. so good. And yeah, get, that's like, almost getting to bassoon territory, isn't it? That's sort yeah. of low. It's low. kind of low, but it's got a kind of readiness to it. That you yeah, yeah. Let's say it's in the sound. Yeah. yeah. Does that affect the harmonics you can do at the top? The fact you've got that extra, you've got a bit more Pop to vent it. from. Yeah, I mean, it just... The, the whole instrument is just a lot more to blow through. You can you can do more. Right. It's not. 
Yeah. But, but you yeah. know, when you've got like, for instance, with the baritone, where I've got so much more tubing and it's so much bigger, I can get so much more action out of the venting of, of, the, of the low notes and I can get so much more, I get more harmonics and all that stuff because there's so much more tubing. Yeah. Is that the same with that? Is that low note more kind of got more potential, for instance? Yeah, it does definitely. I mean, right. <laughs> Yeah. I don't yeah. want to get too loud, but basically you can get yeah, all the yeah, yeah. if you if you really blow it out. Yeah. Have you got really have you got really um touchy neighbours then? Uh are no. They, they're, really they're, they're not touchy at all. I actually spoke to one of the guys recently and he was just like there's no problem with playing at all. He likes it. Um but I've just always had this like phobia of practicing in my house. And it's oh, been really? a thing that, yeah, it's really like been a shaping thing in like all my, all my houses in that I really don't like the feeling of people hearing what I'm playing. I know what you mean. I know exactly what you, you mean. You know, I don't want to feel like, I just want to practice and just have no one bother, like have no like self-consciousness on what yeah, people yeah, yeah. are thinking in relation to what I'm doing. So I've always just practiced really quietly. And I find right. like my technique has become better in playing loud the more I yeah. play quietly. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So now, now I like it. Now it's like when I'm like really in practice quietly and I've like practicing all day, I'm playing really quietly around it. My ear stream is so quick. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm blowing tons of air through the, the instrument. Obviously, the keys are rattly, so you can hear those rattle. Yeah. But the, um, the actual physical um, work that I'm doing is the same as if I was basically blazing the instrument at maximum yeah, volume. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. with a tiny bit of kind of focused air stream. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's interesting that it's fun. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, it's, it's horrible, especially when you're practicing something really, really boring. Oh yeah. Someone, someone next to you is just hearing this, this like one bar just over and over, and over again on some yeah. scale or something. Yeah. Um. So what's what's I was going to ask you. What what I want, wanted to ask you about was your writing process actually. Oh yeah. <clears throat> um. Yeah, because I remember years ago you were. I think I asked you this question and you said that you basically just sit down and listen to what's going on in your head and, and put it on Sibelius and it's just an instant thing. Yeah. Um, is that still how you write? Yeah. <laughs> that's exactly yeah. the same. Yeah. There's yeah. Normally no like update to the writing process. <laughs> I well, if it like, works, sit... why change it? You know? Yeah. I sit down in probably the more, like the driest situation I can. So sometimes I'll go into like the British library. Sometimes yeah. I'll just go into like, well, when you could go to places, I'll just yeah. like, or just sit down somewhere and just like write for ages. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's literally a case of like, I'll sit down with Sibelius, which is a computer program. Um, I'll think of a, a kind of a first phrase, or I might sing it in my head or something, um, or just hear it and I'll try to write it on the page and just literally go note by note, adjusting up or down and adjusting each rhythm. So it just really starts off with it. I might go like, da, 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 da. I'll just write that on the page and then I'll just start adjusting if I if I feel like I want do 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 I might adjust the third note down like a half step or a whole step or third or so, so it's really like so, construction basically. So when when you when you say when you say you're adjusting the note, are you so you've got your first phrase. Yeah. So then do you copy that first phrase into a second phrase and then adjust the note in the second phrase? Or Not are you adjusting the first phrase you keep adjusting the first note phrases it's perfect. What, basically what, everything everything so if if i'm happy with the first phrase i might go ah. into the next phrase but if okay. i'm not happy I, I, I you know you can just like keep playing back on so you can like yeah. make us make a phrase and then you like just kind of hit it and it plays it back to you so yeah. i listen back to that and if i'm not happy i'll just think what do i what am i not happy with yeah i'll just try and then just try to play around with things until i become happy and that might be the rhythm it might be the the pitch um yeah yeah, it, it, basically, it will just be the rhythm or the pitch. So I'll just adjust, adjust and adjust everything until I'm happy, and then I'll move on to the next race, and then I might put something below it. You know, it's so really you kind of start off with your tenor with the saxophone phrase. Um, wh whichever, you know, like could could be so saxophone. Start could start with the bass. Um, yeah. just whatever I've got a vibe for, basically. Yeah. Like as simple as that. that day? Yeah, I um, might I sit down in front of the computer and like first thought, you know, like what yeah. what's coming what's coming to my head. And I just yeah. try to like write that on any instrument and then see what do I think um, orchestration wise it, it's best for. So yeah. I might write something on the tenor and then I might think actually that might sound good on the bass, put that into the yeah. bass. Yeah. Um, it's and kind of, you... 
Go on, no, I can say it's go quite on. a simple process it's in that it's, there's nothing like very um, methodical or like extravagant about it. It's just literally like kind of keep fiddling with it until you like it. You play it it sounds very like methodical it. to me. That sounds very methodical to me. It doesn't yeah. sound accidental. No, not accidental, but I mean in terms of it's, it's almost like trying to adjust things until I'm happy with them. Yes. You know, so you're just trying to get as much material to adjust. So it might be, so for instance, if I'm writing for an album, like say the last Ancestors album, the one that just came out, um, yeah. we it was recorded in two sessions. And right. both of those sessions, we knew we were going to do them. Or I, I booked the studio like a month before or a bit more than a month before. So then yeah. it was like, I've got a month to basically yeah. write an album. Yeah. So what I would do is just like go somewhere and just write ideas all day. Just like... Yeah. Just until it just becomes a matter of like you're thinking ideas onto Sibelius yep. and you cut out that instrument you can just kind of yep. like hear a phrase in your head and essentially just write it on, so you're, write playing, it on. you're playing Sibelius basically basically playing Sibelius and then yep. like have so many things that you can then start just like construct, like architecting yep. just like play fiddling and fiddling um, yep. and then there's like a separate process of going through the stuff that you've been fiddling with yep. and kind of forming it into a constructed like kind of piece and that might be stripping away things it might be adding stuff yeah um, and i find that's just how i work for everything literally the sons of kemet album that we we basically finished recording that we're mixing at the moment it was a different process altogether in mm. that i had nothing basically this we had booked the studio and it's like i've got you know the studio needs to be booked in like say january or february um the first february the 14th so we booked the, the studio date and it's getting nearer and nearer, and I was like, okay, I've got two kind of tour periods. I'm definitely going to write the album and this one. And that tour came, and it's like, didn't really feel like it. It was on the bus, yeah. and I'm tired, and nothing yeah. happened. And then I was like, okay, it's fine. So I've got one more, like, two-week run in Europe. And yeah. I've got that two-week run in Europe, and then I've got, like, a kind of holiday uh, where I was walking around the coast of Wales. Right. Um, and just kind of, like, spending a, a night in, in each place. Uh, so like walking right. in a kind of kind of camper bag and spending a night in each place going around for like yeah. 12 nights walking like 7k each day um, right so i was like i don't want to do any work when i'm on my holiday no so i'm just gonna definitely do it on this two-week comet tour i thought yeah. before that didn't do anything <laughs> the tour right. just came i went so then i'm like coming it's getting closer and closer and yeah. i'm in the walking thing and i'm like it was a point where i'm like four days and i'm like i've got four days four until days the, <laughs> until the weekend before the session. I, like, so, is the session like the whole album in one session, or how um, much of the album did you want to try and do? The whole album. Okay. So, so basically, you, got... you had four days in the studio, and I was like, oh, okay, so, yeah. This is the most that I basically would ever record. Like most of the albums would be like two days, and we'll have yeah. an album. Uh, but I gave myself four days just to relax, and it was like four days before I had nothing. Then I basically went through for the last year or so on tour. I've been like playing around with Gary's band on my iPad, just right. like, kind of being bored in the van, like just yeah. playing. And I don't have a big knowledge of like Logic or Ableton, so Gary's band yeah. is so easy you can just like tap with your fingers. Yeah, yeah, it's great, especially yeah. on the iPad. Yeah, it's amazing. And basically, I just went through all my iPad thing that I've jammed for the year, and then just like in this kind of whole night like, burst, transcribed everything onto Sibelius, and then oh, started right. with that as my kind of like groundwork musical ideas that then I could build on. So then in that weekend before the session, I just like work from morning to evening, like yeah. not a lot of sleep at all and just like got an album that, you know, pretty happy with. Oh, right. Well, yeah. clutch from the jaws of defeat. Oh my God. It came so... <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, that's how a lot of things happen with me. It's like, I'll go right up to the last minute. Yeah. But then at that last minute, I'll get really hyper-focused and just yeah. like do a lot of work. Yeah. You know? But, but I just, to... Go on. No, no, it doesn't, it's like it only works if you've got little things that you've been working on to yeah. the run up. But it doesn't work yeah. like actually creating in the last minute. I find it works yeah. editing and, and like kind of refining yeah. in the last minute. I find when there's a time pressure, I stop experimenting. Yeah. Because you can't just kind of see, I wonder what will happen if I try this for a bit. And you can't run the risk of that taking a day or a week. Yeah. You know, I mean, you might at the end of it come up with something you'd never have thought of before. But as soon as I found this within the Acoustic Ladyland album that we haven't released, which is um, that, yeah, as soon as I got under time pressure, I stopped experimenting. I just kind of like, right, shit, I'm going to get this written. <laughs> and just write it, you know. Um, and then, yeah, 
I, I used to always do things like that, actually. I, did, I used to do things, but then I got into trouble a few times where oh, yeah. it just felt quite pressurised and didn't really work with the kind of music I was trying to make, you know, mm. like, because the rehearsals were quite limited. We had quite limited rehearsal times as well, and it felt like we needed a period of time to figure out where the writing ended and the improvising started. Yeah. So, and so it was every time you play, you can hear the writing, then you can hear the improvising, then you can hear the writing. It took a while to sort of blur those two states, you know. Yeah. How much do the charts evolve while recording? Yeah, a lot. Oh, actually, while recording them. Oh, while recording them. Yeah. Mm. I mean, I find uh, a lot of times with, with, with me, we'll will be certain parts in the charts where we're free to just kind of like go out and it might be that I can cue in at certain sections. Yeah. So I like to write, but then still like in the actual recording, I might say, wait for my cue on a certain part or, yeah. you know, or it might not be like written, but there'll be that yeah. knowledge that if we're hearing something in the studio, we can actually just um, kind of go, play it by ear, like go by instinct. In terms How of do you find that though in the something. studio? Don't you find that quite difficult in the studio? Uh, playing by your own, going by instincts. Not really. Not if I've got the chart to basically. We could play the chart, but if in that moment, yeah, we hear like this section needs to be a bit longer. There's a lot yeah. of kind of like me just doing this. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. Know, like my hands just kind of going around the place. You've got to be really comfortable in the studio. And lots of vis visibility and yeah, everyone's got to feel really comfortable, is not they? Yeah, it depends where you record. Like I really like Livingston Studio, one in yeah. the green, because yeah. you've got that big room in the middle and you can yeah, actually yeah. see it all around. Or like yeah. Fish Factory, obviously, is the kind of classic. Where, sorry? Uh, Fish, Fish Factory. Factory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah my, my recording process has completely changed um, with this album. It's totally different. We just, we mm. tracked everything. We, we recorded bass and drums uh, in the studio, but then we tracked everything. And I recorded all the sax. Well, no, not all the saxophones. George and I did some of the songs at Ben Hillier's studio in um, near Lewis, which is a yeah. really lovely place. He's got an old barn that he converted. Um, it's great. But then a lot of the stuff was just done here in the studio, in my, right. in my studio, the saxophones. And it, it was a completely different way of playing for me. It was great because normally, like you say, you, you, you write your music and then you've got your rehearsal and then you've got your, your set studio time and you've got to kind of perform in that, in that time. You know, so the, com the studio has to be very comfortable. Everyone has to be on good form. It has to, it's quite a lot of different things that have to align for it to be really magical and really special. Um, and, I, and I sometimes used to feel like as the band leader that, that it was... It was me that had practiced the least because I'd been the one who'd been writing the music. And everyone oh, yeah. was coming up with chops <laughs> blazing, you know, and I couldn't hardly play because I'd just been writing for, for a month, you know. Um, you know, I hadn't had time to actually practice the music I'd been writing either. Yeah. And so that's quite quite weird perspective to be at. So this one was interesting because it meant I could just noodle about on the baritone for a day and just record all the noodling, you know, over a track and then maybe choose the bits that I liked. And then, yeah. so sort of knowing that I've got that freedom, then changed the way I played, and I can I can explore bits, and I can. And it's just it was really really great, you know. Um, it's a really nice way to work. It's just felt so different to yeah. what, I've, what I've done before, which has always been about even the second now album was, was all very kind of live. We recorded it all live, you know, in the studio. Yeah. Really, but yeah, it's an interesting, interesting thing. I didn't used to like tracking very much because it's always you're tracking a horn section or you, thing, or you're tracking a written melody or something. There's not very much freedom, but doing it this way was interesting because then I could build the track from what I'd messed around with as well and yeah, I wanted yeah. it to turn left I could which in Melty Stuff Down is quite odd because it, it, often the, it, there isn't that space to kind of if if the track wants to go left it can it's kind of like it's on a definite path now we're going to the end here you know yeah, yeah. So there's a couple of tunes though that I, I did do that just opened it up a bit which is quite nice quite interesting to do. Right. but yeah yeah, yeah yeah I bought a sound card for the first time oh yeah um and I've got like a mic uh, and logic. So I've been trying, you know, I'm basically going to try to start doing that in this time, basically on lockdown, like recording yeah. myself and just kind of experimenting in that way. You've got a MIDI keyboard as well. I do have a MIDI keyboard, yeah. Yeah, that's the thing as well, because then you start. Yeah. I mean, the iPad, you can use, um, you can get Logic Remote on the iPad. You know about that? Oh, yeah. yeah. It's a little app you can get on the iPad, which means you can play the drums on the iPad. With oh, I see, yeah. That's, you, you tap the iPad and it comes up in Logic. That's, oh, that's wow. quite nice. It does yeah, kind of, yeah. it does knacker your fingers after a while, kind of smashing your fingers into a, a glass screen as opposed to a nice kind of soft rubber surface. So if you do it too long or too hard, you end up 
point, your index fingers really hurt. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, we've got some lovely uh, things. This dude don't let you back speak. Uh, well, if you probably didn't hear the last hour that I've been babbling on. <laughs> <laughs> Do you try to record everything together or are some parts recorded separately and added in later? Um, I I don't, you know, Pete, I think the last mate said that album, album that you're saying, recorded in de different parts. I don't yeah. do that a lot, but I've done it with a lot of people. Like, say, Heliocentrics records a lot like that. Yeah. Where they'll do it in, like, kind of chunks and you can definitely get good, yeah, like, I was, like, really kind of, like, really good parts together. Like, I find it's a different way of being creative when you're tracking. It's, yeah. um, it's like you've got to go into that like kind of headspace yeah. of like almost like really ultra listening. Like, it's almost like you're trying to find the vibe with a virus already set. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, as opposed to like bouncing off each other. Yeah. Um, but in a good way, I kind of I, I like that challenge. Of, like you know. Are you, talking about, so, are you talking about when you do a solo over something after the band played that section? Yeah, exactly. But then you've heard them record that section, so you sort of know what they're going to do and where things yeah. are going to happen. Or not. <laughs> or like, you know, I've done some sessions where you kind of like, you're going in tracking it, but you basically just do you on tick. Yeah. Yeah. And then you just yeah. kind of like jump in and you, you know, you're like hearing it for the first time. Yeah. Um, but knowing that no one's going to change in terms of what you do, that you only have to accommodate what other people are doing. Yeah. It's a kind of, yeah, I find yeah. like kind of awkwardly yeah. um, funny. Yeah, it's a different discipline, isn't it? Different yeah. Approach. Yeah. Um, so you just finished recording a new Kemet record. Yeah, we recorded it like about February. Okay. Yeah. Where was that? In same like um, Livingston. Okay. Nice yeah. one. Was it February or? No, we recorded it a while ago. <laughs> Uh, oh, right, okay. remember, basically all my mumps basically jum jumble up but essentially we're starting to mix it now okay. um, it was it was recorded yeah I think it was recorded sometime last year and then it's just been kind of waiting and waiting I had been basically wanting to do horn arrangements but actually this completely invalidates everything that I just said I've started <laughs> to <laughs> I started to write all these horn arrangements and I had this idea of getting like a horn section in to do the Kemet recording and I, I saw this band when we did Fuji Rock with Comet in in, Tok in Tokyo. Um, that was like from Mongolia. I can't remember the name of the band, but it had like um, I think tenor, what was it? tenor, um, alto, two trumpets, two trombones, um, something else. Wow. Um, but basically, like that kind of eight-piece horn section. Right. Uh, but every instrument, like like the kind of horns doubled up, so double saxophone, double trumpet, double yeah. trombone, yeah. Um, and then kind of like full rhythm section. And this, the sound was massive. Basically just loads yeah, of horns yeah. playing in like unison or fifth. Like right, there was just okay. nothing like very wow. complex about it. So I had that idea for the Kemet thing. Yeah. And I was like basically getting all these like kind of charts ready and writing. And yeah. it just took ages. Then I kind of got distracted and I was coming back to it. And then this whole thing happened. And yeah. my whole thing was like, I was going to record that just before I went on the Ancestors tour. So in a month's practicing for this Copeland Concerto, I was like finishing off these Kemet parts. Yeah. Um, and now this has happened. So I'm just like, you know what, whatever. Let's just finish the Kemet album without those, those Oh, parts. right, okay. But well, can you record uh, those parts at home now? Got yeah, I could do, but <laughs> it's like, I, I kind of like the idea of, of like having loads of people in a room together. That's, yeah. In some ways, that's the sound that I was hearing. So recording... Yeah. Um, separately to the original take, but with yeah. like loads of people in the room playing it together, so it yeah. would be a different atmosphere if we played it like you know separately and then put it stitch it together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it would be yeah, yeah. yeah. No. But I think that's definitely something that you need to come back to the kind of like gang, gang horn section. Gang horn, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's a certain way of writing some horns, like the way they use horns in grime and some of those yeah. American American dance records. You know, you like you say like the roots and fists thing. Um, and then they're, they're often horn samples, but I love that sound. It's so brutal. Yeah. Have you heard Stormzy's last album? Yeah. Because you know, there's the beginning. It starts with a big horn section. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's Fion plays on that. You know, he was in the in that. Oh right, section. okay. Yeah, probably right. like that kind of Kano connection. He plays with Kano right. as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's it's interesting. I, I it's always it sounds really modern when people do that as well. You know. Yeah. Yeah. I find um, often you like. 
when things are really kind of like um, elemental, it yeah. can sound really kind of like traditional or really modern. Yeah, yeah, you know exactly. I mean? yeah. Like it kind of passes that middle ground of sounding. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> trendy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was going to um, I was going to ask you about um, yeah, who's who's mixing the the Kemet record then? Um, Dill. Oh, Dill's doing it again. Yeah, right. I'm basically Dill's my guy. Dill, I kind of yeah. just trust the um, yeah, yeah. Dill's ears that I can know he's going to make my sound sound my sax sound how I like it. Does he and mix all your stuff then? Yeah, he kind of mixed the ancestors. He's mixed the last. Um, he makes the last Kemet album and he makes the first Kemet album in it yeah. along with Seb. Seb makes the second one. Yeah. Um, but in general, I just get him to mix everything because um, yeah, yeah, he's got a, a way of mixing where it sounds it's a, it's like a kind of acoustic sound. Yeah. But without sounding, but with the kind of benefit of um, technology in a way that you associate with like dub records. Yeah, where sometimes they sound very rootsy and earthy. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. In a way that can still handle some electronics or some modern stuff, kind of. In yeah, there. sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. And he's really good at editing. So a lot of stuff that we'll do, we'll basically record loads of time, loads of tape, yeah, uh, loads of jams, and then basically he'll kind of get his scissors out and like, and yeah. we'll sit down and like craft an album out of it. Or I'll yeah. kind of like, with the Kemet one, I basically took all the takes and like got points with him, like kind of to to snip up. And yeah. like piece together. Yeah, great. Well, you can learn to do that yourself now, can't you? Exactly, and that's yeah, <laughs> what I'm kind of starting on. Yeah, because I've I've since getting into logic like that, I've I've um, it's totally changed the way I write because I write because I, I used to write from a more conceptual point in the face, like sort of sitting down and sort of designing the music or kind of building and working on that. But but now I um, I just put on sometimes it's just a metronome. Just, just a tempo, and I just play, and um, and then I just go back over the over the recording of what I played, and just find bits that I like, and then uh, delete delete everything else, and then build songs from that. So it's kind of, it's a much less, it's a much more because it comes from an improvising place. Yeah. Because that's one thing I always find difficult with writing, where you've got playing being really free and really spontaneous and really open. Um, so then writing felt like the opposite. The way I used to write, sort of very sort of slow and meticulous, and 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 yeah, very studied. So yeah. this is a way of kind of keeping that feeling of it being free and open, but also having what's the necessary, you know, focus as well. Do you do you, do you find that you part different, so different from playing? Uh, different what? Well, how when you you've got a way of you've got a way of playing which is very free and very open and very passionate, but then when you're writing. It's, you're not you're not in a you're in a completely different sort of physical mental space oh yeah definitely um, completely how do you cope with that because if you're if you're in a in a very sort of let's say sort of scientific place when yeah. you're writing but you're writing for that version of you that's going to be very wild and free yeah so how do you how do you reconcile that in your head? like the the different versions of myself um They've come to an understanding, basically. <laughs> they, they just let everyone, lets everyone do whatever they do their thing. So like right. the scientific kind of methodical um, Shabaka that sits down to write an album yeah. just does its thing with the knowledge that the kind of like wild man Shabaka with the saxophone that's sweaty and, you know, yeah. um, with his shirt off or whatever, is just going to play however he plays it. <laughs> right, right, okay. Because, you know? yeah, it's like, and that's in some way what gets for me the, the interest what happens when that like range of emotional states that you are in when you're writing? Yeah. What happens when that meets the kind yeah. of warmed up saxophone player that has a lot of stuff to get out? Yeah. So it yeah, might yeah, be yeah. that he's written something really cerebral that sounds really cerebral and kind of clinical, but then when you get your saxophone, you are and you know that you're playing it for an audience that wants to like move. You're going to interpret that in a way. Yeah. And that's how the kind of musicality comes into it. How do you interpret it in a way that makes it sound appropriate for what your actual kind of gigs are or what the the, the, yeah. the kind of album is going to be? Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then that's in some ways how the, the composing changes because if you find there might be certain things that you write in that cerebral space that don't work as well in a live context, if you find a clash between personalities, yeah. 
Uh, yeah. And that's maybe the thing that you I then work on. Like, what yeah. are those specific elements that don't come out that, you know, that don't translate that well? Yeah. I guess if you're writing for a project that's got a specific sound, you're going to kind of, you're going, going to kind of know that this will or won't work. Yeah. For that particular context. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Interesting. And do you yeah. do that consciously? Does that happen consciously? Um, or does it just kind of happen naturally now? Yeah, it just, it just happens. I mean, yeah. I, I, I mean, most of the time it's just like, um, just like working musician concerns in that, You've got an album. You've got to produce something. You've got to produce a certain yeah. amount of material because yeah. you need to record an album. And the way I do it, it's all under time pressure. So it's like yeah. I need to be in the studio on this date. So I need to produce. I need to have this much material for an album. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it's yeah, it's, yeah. it's very kind of clear, dry. It's like you need to make this much tracks. So then I might think the creative part is me thinking what is the arc going to be? How many like slow tunes do I need to write, how many yeah. quick tunes, da, da 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 just as a basic kind of template to get into writing loads of stuff. Yeah. And yeah, then yeah. once you've got all that stuff, then you can start to like edit and refine downwards. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's not really, yeah, other than the time pressure, of you've just got to produce something. In, in, yeah. And the reason I always like, like to refer to it as time pressure, it means it takes that romanticism out of it in terms of being inspired or being in the vibe. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. It's just yeah. like you are a worker. Like produce yeah. a tune that you enjoy. Yeah, just sit, no. just just get on with it. Yeah, get on with it. Yeah, I'm just like you have two hours to like write a tune, and it's got to be something that you're happy with. Yeah. So then sit down and just do it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is the way. And so you've been using the same technique for all the projects you you've been doing. So this is a, uh, not so with comet. Comet, oh, comet. comet is comet is just like we just get into a room for like four days and just jam right okay and then they just go around and kind of cut an album out of it dan and dan and max do dan and max yeah while okay. i'm touring with another band and it's All literally right. you know if we're in the studio and like this kind of bits that we think this is you know definitely a kind of tune that we're kind of coming up with we might stop and say let's kind of start like get a clean start or like a clean end yeah but in and it might be that when they're kind of making the album that they kind of call me back and go get half a day in a studio so you can just like get some clean versions of a certain like kind of heads or something but the majority yeah. of the album is just we, we book a studio for three to four days and we just kind of improvise from morning to evening but improvise right. melodically knowing yeah. that we're gonna you know yeah yeah what we do yeah yeah because that's that's sort of when i'm when i'm soloing over the over the, the track that i'm making i'm sort of i'm soloing i'm improvising but i'm doing it with a half an ear for like I'm looking for hooks or I'm looking for yeah. things I can use. It's not the same as a, a solo where I'm, I'm not soloing. It's, it, it is a solo, but it's like a kind of speculative kind of yeah. thing. The thing, that's all like composition is really. It's like, you yeah. know, if you, you're the kind of musician that's very like musical in terms of the really like considered in terms of how you build solos, mm. you know, to kind of take that, that type of improvisation, just put it onto paper. Yeah, but put loads of it onto paper, and then you kind of construct it. It's it's very similar to to composition. Yeah, you know, it's like trying to kind of get those aspects kind of linked up. You know, of like improvising, and for me, yeah, like com comp the only thing that separates composition from improvisation is the ability to like edit, the ability yeah. to kind of like listen back and make adjustments until you you definitely are ha are very happy with whatever. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Interesting. And I was going to ask you as well, like the, the new um, Tobacco and the Ancestors stuff, I was really impressed by your, the Instagram, social media, the, the, the little film of you kind of running in the in black and white. Oh, yeah. Um, did that, was that all your thinking or was that a group thing? Um, group so this was um, Jordan who runs Tenetnet. Um, and I've been working with him for like years and years. Yeah. So, he was just one of the, you know, we, we knew him from the kind of like Total Refreshment Center days, and he was at a band yeah, called yeah, Pothead yeah. Show. Um, right. And basically, he did he does all the Comet stuff. Um, we hang out all the time. And we, the, the record label said, we just want you to do some videos kind of reciting the poems. Um, yeah. So, like, we've got to get Jordan in with it. 
And Jordan just kind of came with this idea that was so over the top. Like, <laughs> just like, you're going to be like walking through all these different light settings with your top off and like running and, you know, but I was like, yeah, yeah. whatever, just do it. Yeah. Yeah. So in, in some sense, it was his idea. Um, and it just really, yeah, kind of, we sent him all the material about how, what the album was about. And it's just like, what do you think to this? Yeah. Yeah, great. Someone actually think... wrote... Go on. No, I was just right. I just remember someone questioned before um, saying what was what the kind of link with the Shabaka and your ancestors album in regards to like how timely it is, um, especially the titles and stuff to like what's going on right now. Yeah. Uh, even the release date, it kind of released on at a point where there's definitely a shift in the level of like sen- general sense of panic especially over here on, yeah. the, fr- on the Friday the 13th. Uh, yeah. And I think it was the day that also the US um, put a state of emergency. Um, yeah. It's one of those things where it's like, you know, we got, you know, we got the concept of the album, you know, ages ago, you know, and obviously an album from the point at which it kind of like drops, it's got to be basically finished in, in its totality about like four months before. Yeah. Um, so you're thinking like half a year ago, sitting down and like thinking about the concept of the album and the poetry and you know mm. and i think there's some things that happen intuitively that you know if you analyze it you can see how it maybe links up to current events yeah um if you are in tune to just like what's happening and you are trying to just have a flow of creative ideas i find sometimes like um, coincidences like that happen artistically where yeah someone might do something that seems very timely um, yeah. But it's maybe just because if you are having awareness of the past and you're living with an, some kind of awareness of what's happening in the present, you kind of manifest the future. You can feel, uh, you can feel the momentum of it. Yeah, maybe in terms of a sense of urgency. Um, but I don't know. It's it's not something that I thought, you know what, there's going to be a global pandemic that wipes out yeah. everything that we thought was a fixture in this kind of stage of late capitalism. Yeah. <laughs> no. yeah. That would have been that would have been incredible, wouldn't it? Yeah, it would have been. Because so, Jordan filmed you um, running through the streets, running through the streets for one of the videos. Did, yeah, for Sons of Kemet. Yeah, he did another thing of running. Yeah. Um, that was really tough to try to stop the sax from like bashing into my mouth. Yeah. Obviously, the shock of running and playing the sax is not as easy as it looks. Yeah, he likes getting you running, doesn't he? Yeah, he does. Yeah, kind of slightly <laughs> concerning. I think he might even be watching this. I saw Ken in it pop up at some oh, point. Yeah. Hello, Jordan. Yeah. So the Kemet, um, when's the when's the release plan for the Kemet? Um, don't know, basically. I think yeah. originally you were thinking of doing it like the be- beginning of next year. Yeah. Just so that we had enough time to let the Ancestors album sit. Yeah. And then that comes. Um, also, just so we've got a lot of time to just like get the artwork completed and yeah, get yeah, all yeah, the folk. Yeah. Yeah. Because I mean, this is ideally like my ideal is having the album finished like around now. And then just having a long time to like, un, in an unhurried way, get all the stuff around the album, like visually how it's gonna be represented and all that kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. And I like to, in terms of like the story of the album, like what the album is about. I find you've got the music recorded, and then there's this process of like, almost self-reflecting of like, what was I feeling around the type, you know, for that period. Yeah. So I like I have the mixes and then I'll be like listening to them or walking around or just like yeah. chilling with them and just thinking about like what's that all about and that yeah. normally just kind of ends up being you know what the album is yeah. is about and just trying to make it poetic trying to make it like as poetic as possible whatever poet poetic means you know yeah that's nice 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 yeah. way of putting it yeah yeah interesting so and do you um. When you booked the studio, I was going to ask you this. You know, you said before that you booked the studio, to to, to so you work backwards from there, saying like that's the studio date. So I've got to have the music written by this time. So you work backwards. Yeah. yeah. Do you when you book the studio? Do you also have in mind when the album's going to come out? No. Not really. No, basically. I mean, in general, we've had we've had to have like kind of big level plans, just yeah. in terms of juggling three bands. Yeah. Right. Uh, so we know that like. Like, say, three years ago, The Ancestors was on tour. Um, we toured for more or less the whole year. But it was a kind of clusterfuck of lots of different, of all the bands basically yeah. taking in the kind of free time, and I just didn't have any time for myself for that whole year. Yeah. Then yeah. after that, Sunday Kemet was the focus, and then we toured 
uh, no, this was, yeah, like, like two years ago, we told many sons of Kemet. So the yeah. idea was then we record the kind of comet at the beginning of that year so that it could come out next year. Yeah. Um, so then the comet came out uh, that year when we'd already been recording Ancestors. Um, yeah. We did the, fir- the last bit of recording at the start of the comet tour, so like last February, so that we knew that after the comet, there's a kind of year of touring, the Ancestors start touring what should be now. Yeah. And in this start of the year, I start working on the Kemet album, which should be released the next year. And then that yeah. next year comes and we release the Kemet album the same kind of time, hopefully, you know, and then the Kemet starts touring. So in general, it's been looking at it by years. Um, and it's, it's kind of, for me, it's, it's just like if I basically keep chipping away at, at, at work, you know, so yeah. I never really kind of stop as such. It's just like keep yeah. like doing little bits of, of stuff. And yeah. then when when kind of shit hits the fan, as in I've got an imminent deadline, I kind of like go the extra mile and get everything together. Yeah, yeah. So you're keeping the engine ticking along all the time. Yeah, yeah. And then just taking it on a kind of proper like run <laughs> whenever. Yeah, 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 yeah. Interesting, man. So, but at the moment we don't know when the next thing is, do we? This is the thing. No one knows that it might it might come out. You know, and I guess the thing is, and this is some, this is the thing we're having, like as a manager. Um, shout out Rachel Miller. Um, Hello, Rachel. So there's all kind of like concerns uh, in terms of like whether you want to release an album, uh, definitely in conjunction with touring. And this yeah. is going to be the thing that musicians yeah. are going to be like considering now, whether yeah. it's worth, whether they want to release an album not being able to tour it, or whether yeah. it's better to wait until the touring circuits are back to like how they normally are, so you can release an album, yeah. having people be able to see you shortly afterwards. Yeah, and yeah. that's something that I've wondered about before as well, where, you know, we, we've even done tours where the tour starts and then the album comes out halfway through the tour. Oh, yeah. Because, I mean, I think the thinking is that the publicity for the music, for the release of the album is going to be at its zenith around the same time as your tour anyway. So if, if you go on tour a few days before, it's not going to really affect it. Mm. And then I've, I've also done things where you released it and it comes out, the, you know, the next day kind of thing. Yeah. Or, or very, very soon around the album. And I've often thought that it felt a bit early to me. It's always because you kind of know, because you, you're used to when you're playing the old set, you're used to that because everyone sort of knows the songs and everyone's, you know, you can hear people go, yeah, when you play a certain song they like. Yeah. And you start playing all these new songs and everyone's just completely right. <laughs> and so it's like, well, would it be better to go on tour once everyone's kind of heard it and live with it for a while? Yeah. And then everyone's going to have their favourites and everyone's going to, uh, so that's sort of like something, something I've never done. Um, yeah, well, this is often going to be happening. <laughs> But now it's going to happen because yeah. the album came out last week and we're not touring till um, October. So yeah. we'll see. <laughs> I think we'll see like, when, when touring out. does happen, the energy is going to be amazing. I know. Because like, people really have been, would have been starved from this, like, this kind of perfect storm of people starved from live music. Uh, but yeah. then those are musicians who have been basically just like sharpening their swords. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. not necessarily practicing technically every single day, but just like conceptually getting a clean slate yeah. i find that sometimes really helpful like doing practice but then having that space of just like having a rupture to what you normally do yeah to get a new like rejuvenated even just like a pause with seeing with those relationships so you're not yeah. seeing the musicians that you've seen all the time yeah for a while yeah, yeah. and then yeah. you come back and there's that energy of like um you're playing again for the first time in ages you know yeah 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 it's gonna be amazing it's gonna be an interesting time I mean, yeah. I just, yeah, like, to almost take us back to the beginning of the conversation where, you know, China have have, um, have started going back into lockdown because they, they kind of, like, let people out too early. And they're talking about us being in lockdown for six months so that we can, so that we can, um, you know, avoid avoid that second wave. Being yeah. Out. So we're still in lockdown when the second wave hits and then we're through it. Because what you don't want is everyone comes out, everyone starts partying, which is what's going to happen. Yeah, and then, then another then another wave hits, you know. That's gonna and this is the thing: it's like if you're basically going to contract, you know, coronavirus from going to a gig, that gig better be the best gig literally ever. of your life, ever. Yeah. And like yeah. the performer better have that like in their mind. If these people are going to risk their lives and the lives of like their mothers <laughs> yeah. and grandparents to see yeah. your music, you better play it so well that they're like, you know what, it was worth it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. And they're going to think that when they go out as well. It's just like, I don't care. I'm going to take the chance, you know. So oh, everyone's, yeah. going to, everyone's going to really want it to be 
Yeah. Someone's just asked here what it's like playing with Louis Maholo. Louis Maholo. Oh, that's amazing. Like, it's very unsettling, actually. Um, right. I've, I've just I've just managed to, in the last year or so, find a way of playing with him. That right. Where and it's a it's like a dynamic thing because he's very dynamic in terms of his his dynamic and emotional range, but he's very quiet. Yeah. Um. So it's a way of me blowing. That's happened recently where I can basically blow as hard as I can, but still hear everything around me. Right. Okay. Whereas I think, like, say, five years ago, if I played loud, there was something about like the way that I was blowing, which was just like decibel level louder. It was like it would obliterate myself. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you know yeah. What yeah. I, mean? I can't hear anything but my own saxophone. Where yeah. 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 I've I've got that. A, yeah, <laughs> it's just, sometimes I'll, it might be the setup as well. Like when I was playing with the old con, where like yeah. I'd be blowing so hard, all I could hear was my own saxophone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, whereas now I feel like I can blow really hard and still hear what's happening around me. Yeah. Which makes it easier with someone like Lewis who wants you to play as hard as possible, but they're not gonna, you know, they're not like rock drummers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, sure. And it's very mysterious kind of play. He, he kind of he he kind of like likes to push you in very like weird psychological ways mm. you know like really kind of like whatever you expect to be happening he, you know if he feels you're going into a rut of like you know if you can feel your complacency they just do stuff to unsettle you yeah like right when you're reaching the kind of peak of your like what you think is your solo you'll just like pull the rug under you and just like yeah 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 you know like, things like that you know that's funny when that happens yeah that's funny when that, that happened to me on this album that actually the last note, there's a track called From the Mouth, and I was just having a real, as Mark Lockhart would call it, a real visit on this track. Oh, yeah. And I had no idea of, of how long it was, and I was just really, really going for it. And I went for that final, super high, high as I could, yeah. belting note, just to really take to the next thing, and the whole band just stopped. And it just <laughs> literally just ends with me, the track ends with me just going, and I, oh, where did everyone go? Yeah. You know, but I've left it in there, because it right. does have this certain chaotic, quality which is quite fun <laughs> oh yeah i mean this yeah. is the thing is um i often think i actually i think i i learned a lot from my early days of playing the polar bay actually with you of the yeah. kind of the the triumphant like <laughs> heroic solo yeah you know the solo where you basically take it to this point where it's just like this is it like if you know like whatever anyone is thinking at that point, you like you're you either play you get to the point of playing your highest notes or your biggest shot or whatever. You yeah, get yeah. to this point of like where it's like, actually the title of the album is perfect for that, like a hundred percent yes. Yeah. Where you basically get to that point where it's yeah. literally one hundred percent yes, and you're like doing that thing of like yeah, you know. Yeah. I think it's yeah, it's very powerful. It's something that I think was maybe missing in the kind of college scene of jazz. Yeah. Um, the that sense of forward momentum where yeah. you're going towards the climax. Yeah. You know, and then when you get there, it's just the beginning of another one. <laughs> well, yeah, because then you can just, once you're there, you can just drop back. Yeah. And just completely do something unexpected, suddenly stop, and yeah. then just kind of go left. And then it's like, oh, okay. And then, then you start off with another. But you have to have the band, to have the band have to be able to handle that. Cause if, yeah. If, like tantric if, jazz. <laughs> yeah? Like tantric jazz. Yeah, right. <laughs> exactly. Just like, just keeping it. On those levels, and then yeah, pushing. Yeah, because if you if you do that, the, the band isn't sensitive enough. The band just carries on plowing on, and you've you've, you've gone this way. Yeah, it can be it can get quite painful. Yeah. All right. right, I might have to go in a minute. Yeah, me too. I need to cook some food. This is the yeah. good thing I find in about being at home. Like I'm actually like cooking more than I or like eating more like wholesomely than I think I yeah. have. In the years of slugging it out on the road, eating cheese yeah, sandwiches. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, at three in the morning. Oh my god. Yeah, yeah. yeah but I am eating. Like... I am eating more though. God. I think mm. Ever I saw this brilliant meme the other day of it's just like kind of week one of isolation and the person looks great, and then week two it's just like complete blob, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's easy to overeat. But... Yeah. Well, you know, whatever. <laughs> but listen, man, it's great to hang out with you finally. Yeah, you too. After all these years, we must yeah. do it again. Yeah, definitely. In, in and I'll give you a shout about that every single day intro. That'd be brilliant yeah, if you were doing that. Cool, man. And thanks to everyone else for listening to us as well. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's just before we leave, I yeah. just remember someone's question from above. Um, have you ever played with Matana Roberts? And basically, we, I did one Polar Bear gig. I think the last you did Polar the last Bear ever game. 
the last, the last ever one, wasn't it? Yeah, and it's basically the two sax sets from me and Matana Roberts. And yeah. we played one tune. I think the tune was like an eight, a, an eight bar loop. We just played that for like an hour and 15 minutes. Yeah. Taken in different directions. Was it in Austria uh, or something like that? It was that? in Austria, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then some of them want to actually play with New Bayer. Um, and yeah, she's on the, basically, New Bayer is like, you know, she's on the last Temet album, the one that you're on, Queen is a Reptile. Yes. On a track. And um, yeah, I love playing with New Bayer. You know. She used to, de- she decked in Polar Bear a few times to Mark. Yeah. I think with you, was it? Yeah, she did a gig, I think. Actually, no. No, 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 she didn't do one with she me. Did, she did, did a couple. She did one in Istanbul. And I and I I very nearly played with her one time when um she did for you in Melt Yourself Down. Oh yeah. Um, at festival number six, and she came and rehearsed and um learned all the learned all the material. She's brilliant. She rehearsed, and then we got in the van and we went to um festival number six, but it was pouring down with rain. We literally just sat in the car park <laughs> and then just drove home. Seven hours oh, there, seven hours back. That's, <laughs> that's that's the nearest I've ever got to. I mean, obviously I played with her in the rehearsal, but I've never done a gig with her. <laughs> yeah. Nearest I got. That's great. <laughs> Yeah. Well, look, I think I'm going to go, and I think cool. I'm going to let you go and have some food. And, um, and yeah, let's speak soon. And Great, that's fine. Cool, you Yeah. Bye. Take care. See you. See ya.